Governor Busby, uh, you listed education as your number one priority as governor. Why did you happen to pick that? Well, really, I think it was a most important segment of our overall program. Uh, I was interested in the economic development of our state, and I thought that uh, without an adequate education, there was no chance of us really making any progress to improve the economy and the lifestyle of our people. I'd been interested in education. I'd served uh, early on in education, and when we had a major program while I was in the legislature. But uh, when I was elected governor, I said I was going to really try and do two things. One was to improve uh, the educational resources in our state at all levels, and, and to, then to have uh, infrastructure built and promote economic development. My interest in education uh, uh, had been as a legislator. Uh, back in 1964, I served on the conference committee that wrote the MFPE, or the Minimum Foundation Program for Education. And I was very active in the creation of vocational education in the state. Back in 1957, we only had two vocational schools. And during the time I was in the legislature, I saw a, a growth uh, from these two vocational schools to 27 state vocational schools with 43 high schools that were equipped to teach vocational courses. So really as governor, I kind of continued some of the things I was interested in as a legislator in education and, and uh, one of the main things that I was interested in was uh, a kindergarten program in our state. We didn't have one dollar being spent for kindergarten in our state. and. So the first thing that I did upon being elected governor was to try and promote a statewide kindergarten program. Uh, I lobbied extremely hard with the legislature in order to start this program. I was successful in passing it in the legislature. But then I was faced with a recession, uh, the worst recession that we'd had in several decades in Georgia, and I had to call a special session in the, of the legislature during the first summer that I was in office and cut $176 million out of the budget. And this hampered me early on in my administration in making educational improvements. But I put together a governor's task force on education and one of the things that they recommended uh, was the creation of the kindergarten program, which we had just had to cut out. Of course, the other thing that was uh, teachers' salaries in our state were extremely low. In fact, the beginning teachers in Georgia only averaged $6,914 annually. And so this was another area that we had to address and did address over the, uh, the next eight years. We had increases for beginning school teachers of a little over 70%. This $6,941 increased to $11,815 for beginning teacher. And we did almost as well with the just the average teacher's salary because it increased by 66% from $10,116 to $16,780. But looking at educational improvements, uh, uh, I think the pupil-teacher ratio in the early elementary grades where children needed more individual attention was one of the most important things that was recommended by the Governor's Task Force on Education. Uh, in 1979, we were able to reduce the pupil-teacher ratio in the first two grades from 1 to 25 to uh, one teacher for every 20 students. So we, we made some improvements in those areas. An area that gave me a problem, though, throughout uh, my uh, entire uh, administration as governor was in remedial education. We had uh, students that uh, would enter the first grade needing remedial help. They needed it in the second grade and the third grade. And as these students began to fall behind, uh, they never caught up. And I had a very difficult time in trying to put uh, remedial education programs in for these students. We had some success, but it was very limited. I think we were more successful uh, in, in the, at the college level uh, when I began my tenure, there was grave concern that Georgia was losing most of its best university uh, and 
college professors because of the low salaries that we had compared to other uh, states, even in the southeast. And we were able to increase the uh, faculty salaries by 84 percent, and which did give Georgia a rank slightly above the southern college average. I think though in economic development and education, I think they go hand in hand that the improvements that we made in vocational education along with the formal education was significant and, and it has meant a lot to the state. I just mentioned the increase that we had in vocational training in our public schools uh, during the time I was in the legislature from 1957 until 1975. Uh, but back in 1975, even with those improvements, only 25% of Georgia high schools had a vocational educational program. And we were able to increase the number of comprehensive high schools from 89 to 193, which was almost 50% of all the high schools in Georgia. And more importantly, 75% of all the students in 1982 attended a comprehensive high school that did provide vocational education as well as uh, college uh, preparation courses. Another thing that uh, was started before I became governor, but which I emphasized, was a, a program called Quick Start. This is where we had industries that would locate in Georgia, but we had unskilled people, and we were able to uh, teach Georgians to operate these plants by the time the brick and mortar were dry. Uh, we had uh, vocational schools that uh, we used to, to uh, gear up to teach uh, an entire factory force. And as I say, by the time the factories were built, we were able to, uh, to, to operate the factories with skilled Georgians uh, trained to the spe uh, specifications of the particular industries. So uh, all of this uh, did improve the quality of education, but if I look at the end of my administration, we still had many, many steps to take before I think we had true quality in education in our state. Uh, since leaving office, I think they've continued to make improvements uh, on quality-based education, a uh, program that Governor Harris had, and I think this is going to continue to be a, a high priority for, the, for not just the current administration, but for many to come. It's kind of interesting, there was a seminar on the recent governors held down in Tifton a year before last, and as the papers were being delivered, it, it, was, it was ironic that almost every governor had made education his mm -hmm. number one priority, and yet most people would feel that Georgia's school system is still not leading the nation by a long mm -hmm. shot, and, and as you say, it has a long ways to go. I think that's because of the... Uh, the fact that we had a low per capita income, uh, we were a poor area of the state, and most of the improvements in education require huge expenditures of money. So uh, you go back to Governor Sanders, when he was governor, he adopted a cause in higher education. I think he did as much as any governor in my memory to, to improve uh, that segment of education, just like I had early elementary education, in which I kind of championed the causes. I think we had many uh, financial restraints on the desires of many of the governors that did make education a high priority. You had considerable opposition in adopting the kindergarten program, did you not? Yes, uh, and, and that's what made it so sad that after I was successful the very first year that I was governor and implementing, I had to be the one to ask to cut it out in, uh, in August. In fact, my daughter was an early elementary teacher and, and uh, had a contract to teach kindergarten in only to see me do away with the kindergarten program after I'd created it. I was just reading that the, uh, at the beginning of your term, the GAE placed kindergartens number five on their list of priorities, and I think a lot of others must have given it a low priority as well, and yet you, you persevered and managed to get it adopted. Well, there's a reason for that. We had, as I just mentioned, extremely low salaries for teachers, yet I knew that uh, you know, there was such a commitment among teachers, they were going to try, and that was the highest part in their own life, they weren't to be teachers. And uh, so I don't blame them for putting a uh, salary very high on their, their, on their agenda. I think they also uh, put uh, pupil-teacher ratios above this, and uh, all of this is important. But a uh, kindergarten program is something we didn't have, it's something we had to make a start in, uh, 
and it's something we did not have adequate money to do and still do the other things needed in education. But I just put a high priority on, on early elementary education as far as pupil teacher ratios were concerned, as far as uh, kindergarten and remedial education. That uh, kindergarten issue got complicated with the uh, tax relief uh, program that uh, Tom Murphy uh, and others supported. Why was he so uh, so much in favor of tax relief at that particular time? Well, you know, when we talk about tax relief, and we're not trying to give relief from state taxes, they were trying to give relief from property taxes, which are lo for local governments and not for the state government. And that's what complicated it, is because they wanted the state to take over a larger share of educational cost. And, and um, uh, when they give the, gave the tax relief, it made the local support uh, uh, less viable. Eventually, you called the uh, tax relief a political hoax. Did you still feel that way about it? Well, Deceptive. actually, if you, if you look at taxes in Georgia, whether it's state taxes or whether it's local taxes, our taxes are low compared to other states in the United States, and the needs in this state for education are high now, and they were even higher back then. And I just think, given everything is right prior to education, should have come out better than it did. Okay. You mentioned one of the problems is not enough money to meet all of the needs in education. Didn't you uh, make a pledge that there would be no tax increase during your first term in office? Yes, I did. And, and again, I, th I think that uh, I mentioned earlier about Governor Carter's restructuring state government. We were able to, we were growing in state government at such a level that I said that if we could just stop the growth in the state government and use the the money that would have been spent for this future growth, uh, that we could uh, enrich programs such as an education, and which we did do. And we were, I was able to hold until about the, through the sixth year with the same number of employees that I started with. I reduced and I never built back up to that level again until about the sixth year. Okay. Getting a new constitution adopted, I would think, uh, must be one of the highlights of your administration. Do you agree that it uh, should be ranked up there at the top? Well, uh, I think that uh, this is one thing that's not going to happen with every governor. Uh, I had a, a burning desire to do something with the constitution in Georgia because I'd been involved in two early failures. Back in the summer of 1963, I served on the Constitutional Revision Commission uh, under Governor Sanders. Uh, and we were able to pass a new constitution in the legislature, which I didn't think was very good because I think a special interest came in and dominated the sessions. But in any event, after it was passed because of the ruling uh, in the case of Toombs versus Fortson uh, by the federal courts, which ruled that the uh, the product uh, that we came out with for a new constitution was a result of a malapportioned, uh, malapportioned legislature that they, they would not let the people vote on it. And then the Supreme Court came back later and said the court was an error, but the election was over with, so th that went down the drain and nothing became of it. Then in 1979, uh, Governor Maddox had a constitutional revision commission, uh, and uh, this uh, effort was approved by the House in 1907 and then killed by the Senate. So we had quite a struggle in creating a, a new constitution, but uh, I think the way we went about the constitutional revision, uh, we gained a lot from the experience and the failures that we'd previously experienced, but uh, we were able to come up, I think, with a, with a good document. The Georgia Constitution was the most amended uh, constitution in the United States. It was an unwieldy constitution. Was that its big problem, just the fact that it, it had over 800 amendments and was confusing? Well, wh what you got into was that uh, you had uh, statutes that were really placed into the Constitution, and then uh, they were passed to meet a need of the day. And then when the days changed and uh, future needs arose, and you had restraints and impediments caused by the Constitution itself and were not so easily changed. The other thing is that uh, it was giving, it was giving uh, by way of local constitutional amendments, it was giving away uh, a state government to local governments over which we had no control. Uh, it, it was just an unwieldy document and, and these local uh, constitutional amendments uh, 
uh, just created a nightmare as far as trying to operate a state government. In order to uh, get a new constitution adopted, you you had the existing constitution edited and then approved by the people in 1976. What did that process accomplish? Well, we, we had success and failure out of it. What we tried to do was to take the constitution and redraft it into an into orderly document. We would have revenue mentioned in seven different articles of the constitution. There was no way to address uh, one article at the time of our constitution because the subject matter was just so confused and spread throughout the constitution. So we made an effort to, to uh, have an Office of Legislative Council modernize the existing constitution and index it in an orderly fashion and we could consider just one article at the time. We could address education one year, judiciary one year, and break it down into segments. But what happened was that uh, we were successful in passing two articles of this revised constitution, editorial re editorially revised, and then when we submitted two of the articles to the people, they voted it down because we had so many constitutional amendments, they just voted them practically all down. And so we had to come back and then start all over again. But we did have the benefit of working when we had our constitutional revision on a document that, that had been modernized and indexed uh, by subject matter. So we were able to address the judiciary separately from education, revenue separately from taxes, I mean from uh, revenue and taxes separately from uh, uh, other segments of the Constitution. You've written that uh, Robin Harris was named uh, executive director of the Select uh, Committee on Constitutional Revision and that without his leadership there would be no new Constitution. What did uh, Mr. Harris do that was so valuable in this process? Well, Robin Harris uh, grew up through the legislative process. He was extremely independent as, uh, as a legislator. He had a reputation uh, as far as integrity is surpassed by none. And uh, all of the legislators knew that special interests has gotten, had gotten involved in the effort we had made in 1963. And I think that he brought credibility to the whole effort. It was an open process and I think that he helped to make it so. Okay. You had, uh, what was it, nine article committees with uh, lots of citizen participation in, in studying the, the Constitution and proposing revisions. Uh, was that an effective process? It was, and this was the way we gained a lot of substance in what we were doing on an article-by-article article basis, and it uh, and, uh, helped the, in the final passage of the Constitution because you had had uh, so much public involvement in writing the various articles of the Constitution. But yet ultimately the the finished product still had to be approved by the General Assembly, did it not? Yes, and we came up with another strategy whereby we created a select committee uh, which the Lieutenant Governor served on along with the Speaker and the Governor. And uh, I think what made the uh, passage in the legislature possible was the fact that all three of us attended every meeting of the select committee. And uh, we understood what was involved. We'd been a part of everything that was involved. And we were able to come together working as a team and, and pass it very handily in, in both uh, the House and also in the Senate and then sell it to the people jointly. Well, I was just reviewing the newspapers back in that period. and. Uh, it seems that uh, you got quite upset in the special session in September 1981 when members of the legislature were trying to change some of the portions of the Constitution and you uh, told them something to the effect that they may as well just give up and go home. And well, I'll tell you, uh, Tom Murphy, the speaker, almost fell out with me, or did fall out with me <laughs> on that because there was too much tampering by the legislature with the uh, judicial article and they were trying to take power from the Supreme Court and put the legislature supreme, and that's when I did uh, t tell the legislature that I thought it would be best to adjourn Sonny Dye, <coughs> Sonny Dye and just go home and charge it off as a loss, and I really uh, didn't mean it because what I did is that was a long weekend because the following Monday was a holiday, and I knew all of them would be going back home, they'd be seeing the people in uh, local 
communities and that they would be going to church on Sunday and that the people were going to be upset. And I did take it upon myself immediately after I said that to call every editor of every daily newspaper in Georgia and get editorial support for the legislature to come back and be responsible, which they did. So it really had, had a positive effect. Oh, yes. And that was good. In your inaugural address, you had made a big plea for harmony. You said, uh, I quote, the people are tired of personal bickering, petty infighting, political chatter. That kind of gamesman has no place in the serious times in which we find ourselves today. And I ask that we put it aside for the next four years. And I think you repeated that same general sentiment many times, but this was one occasion where you, you did uh, feel the necessity of criticizing the legislature publicly. Well, I came up 18 years in the legislature and uh, I knew the gamesmanship that was being played and a lot of interests that were involved and uh, I was quite sincere when I said it, but I think I got the message to the legislature and then after making such statements, I, I did try to work with them and, and I think I was successful in doing so. Overall, were you satisfied with the new constitution? Uh, I would say I would have to, uh, I don't think, ever be satisfied with anything as being perfect, but uh, it, as I look back at the beginning and the two failures I'd seen earlier, I think uh, I was pleasantly surprised that we came out with the product that we did. You've written the, the objectives in, in the new Constitution were brevity, clarity, and flexibility. Would you say that, that those three things were basically accomplished? Those were accomplished, but you know, we still had some failures. I know we had the same language for cities and for counties. and. Uh, we were able to reduce substantially the, the uh, language for, for the city governments. We came to the same language for counties and they wanted to keep what they had and that was the only time we had to leave the masculine gender and it was neuter until, until then. But uh, basically speaking, it's much shorter and it's much more concise and, and uh, much more workable. Were the biggest changes in the document in, in addition to the, the clarity the uh, banning of local amendments? Oh, I think that was the most significant thing done, was uh, to do away with the local constitutional amendments. And I guess what? Changing and the judicial system? Another thing would be system. the unification of the courts and uh, coming up with a judicial system. That was uh, just a, a nightmare over the years. We had every kind of court and uh, different kinds of courts in, uh, uh, in various counties and cities. Uh, and uh, this was made uniform. Well, as a lawyer, would you say that that has worked out uh, oh. as expected since then? Oh, yes. I think it, uh, I've heard no one trying to make any changes to it because I, I think it uh, was very well written. Okay. Economic development was your second highest priority. Uh, I was reading your policy statement in 1978, and you wrote, it is important that we provide more skilled and better paying jobs for our citizens through an aggressive economic development program with the total resources of the state committed to this effort. That same report continues, in our pursuit of economic expansion, we should place strong emphasis on attracting international investments to Georgia and building international markets for Georgia products. Would you explain how you attempted to implement some of these concepts? Well, <clears throat> I realized that uh, I only had four years to be governor, not dreaming that the Constitution would ever be changed to allow me to have two terms. But even in eight years, I would never have been able to do all the things I would like in economic development because I knew that we had to have an infrastructure on which to build this economic base which did not exist. Uh, I'm, in fact, I just uh, came really face to face with the cold hard fact that we didn't have the infrastructure that we could compete with the states that did have this infrastructure, particularly those in the north. Uh, our ports were inferior, we had no containerized cargo facilities, we, did, we had an adequate airport, we had no international flights, we, we had a interstate uh, road system that was kind of like a chain with missing links. We had arteries that were not uh, scheduled for completion for, for years and years, and even until the 1980s. Um, so I saw that we had to put an infrastructure into place. And I might say uh, a minute ago we talked about 
my working with the legislature. I've never been proud of, of the state and, and, and with the legislature and I was to see the people join hands in order to create the infrastructure necessary to have this economic development. Back in 1974, right before I became governor, I decided I wanted a professional to head the highway department because we had to have an infrastructure and we could never have it on a political process. The roads had to go where they were needed. We didn't have the revenues to do it with and the inter interstates were not scheduled for completion. Uh, when we decided that Tom Molan would be the head of the Department of Transportation, he came to me and I didn't know him very well, only as a professional as the head of engine, uh, he was the chief engineer for the highway department, but he came up with the idea of going on and completing the entire interstate system by having the state to issue state bonds for the entire interstate completion and then as we got our federal allocations each year we would pay off the bonds and then the state would just be charged with the interest. We would uh, then have the benefit of having these roads years in advance. Uh, we would save all costs of inflation but we little dreamed that some of the other states would copy what we did and uh, then we could go to the Congress and they would repay us the interest that we'd paid on these state bonds too. But. Uh, I think that was one of the most significant things about the early completion of the infrastructure when it came to surface transportation. Uh, the uh, idea of, of having a World Congress Center really came out of a rural legislature. George L. Smith was very active in it. Later on, Tom Murphy was active in it. Uh, along with Sloppy Floyd, who was chairman of the Appropriations Committee, all from rural communities. They came back and we doubled uh, the size of the World Congress Center. And we had uh, uh, there's no international banks, as I just stated, but in 1975, the General Assembly changed the laws so as to permit international banks to come here. And the, the first year after the passage, uh, Barclays Bank and the Bank of Tokyo came to Atlanta. And now we have uh, 26 uh, international banks at uh, or 29 international banks in Atlanta I had 26 when I went out of office. Uh, we had the, uh, the state, the local governments, the chambers of commerce and others to join hands in uh, trying to get uh, uh, international flights. We had to have changes in treaties between nations in order to have international flights here. And we were very successful in this effort. We now have international flights from Atlanta to we Brussels to Amsterdam to London to Paris to Frankfurt to Munich to Stuttgart to Tokyo and and still going next month we'll have uh, direct flights to, to Zurich. But on the ports, uh, we, we, we were not able to go forward uh, uh, in many of the industries that we wanted to locate here without having a decent port facility and we had to get legislators from all over Georgia to join together and spend money which we were in lean times uh, in Savannah primarily and in Brunswick. And we came up with a port expansion program over a five year period that we spent $108 million and we saw the tonnage increase from 1975 uh, about 2.7 million tons to over double that uh, in 1982. And so we just saw the legislature cooperate with the governor in trying to create this infrastructure. And there were a lot of other things that we did. We had uh, trade offices in uh, Brussels uh, that served Europe. Uh, we, we greatly expanded on these offices. We had trade offices in uh, Tokyo, expanded on these. We had port offices in, uh, in uh, Bonn and, 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 and in Tokyo, and these have been expanded upon. Uh, we saw the Quick Start program for training people uh, uh, the legislative appropriations increased uh, to finance this and uh, we made a major commitment to, 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 to uh, go forward with economic development. Uh, I started the, the travels uh, abroad uh, every year to the Orient and to, the, uh, to, the, uh, uh, to Europe and we just saw uh, a great capital expansion. In fact, we for the last uh, five years I was governor, we had over a billion dollars a year in capital growth. So I think economic development was, was most successful. You mentioned you traveled abroad quite a bit. Uh, what did you actually do when you went abroad? How, how does that contribute to the economic development? 
Well, uh, there were two types of trips that I would make. One would be where we, we had prospects that were interested in locating in the southeast. Our offices in Tokyo, New York, Baltimore, our offices in, in, uh, in uh, Brussels, New York, Baltimore. I would go call on the CEOs of this, these companies. I would take professional staff with me. If it was necessary, I would have uh, environmental protection people to go there, but environmental permits. I would do whatever it took to, to uh, satisfy that industry. We would be able to handle any requirements that they had in Georgia. Uh, we would uh, take quick start people over to assure the training of their employees. And, and uh, then uh, whatever infrastructure needs that they had, if we didn't have them, then we would try and provide for them. The other type uh, uh, would be where we would go on a blind mission, where we would have major international banks that would have their uh, clients, uh, customers, uh, companies that might be interested in coming here, and we would uh, speak to larger groups, but they were not immediate prospects. But we, we had great success in, in, in uh, attracting these companies. I guess you were the first Georgia governor to do this kind of travel uh, in an extensive manner, were you not? Well, I tell you, John West in South Carolina uh, was the first governor in the South uh, to really make economic development uh, any priority. Uh, and he is the one that called me when he went out of office and suggested that I employ Milt Folds uh, to come to Georgia from South Carolina and head up industry and trade, which I did. Uh, I suppose I picked up from there, and then uh, one of the best things that we had, though, as far as uh, Japan was concerned, was in 1975, I uh, uh, met with 10 uh, leaders of the Japanese business community, top leaders of the business community that were in Atlanta on the way to Augusta to go to the Masters Golf Tournament. And, it was from the, and I invited them to the mansion, and it was that meeting that we decided to form the Japan-U.S. Southeast Association whereby I would get the governors of the seven southeastern states to get the business community to participate from this side and the Japanese leaders would get the business leaders in Japan. And we alternate our meetings now between Japan and, uh, and uh, the United States and uh, rotate among the southeastern states. But we've, we've just uh, saw tremendous growth as a result of that uh, relationship. I was very much involved uh, uh, with uh, other countries uh, in Europe primarily, but I also uh, made trips to Canada, to Mexico. I didn't accomplish anything in Mexico, but I did in Canada. Mm -hmm. I was just reading that 143,000 new manufacturing jobs were added uh, during your eight years as governor, and about eight billion dollars in new and existing plant investments, and just about doubling per capita income. So there was substantial growth during that period of time. Yes, and, and I think that uh, the fact that Atlanta, uh, in the same period of time, grew into the, the, the hub of the South as far as uh, uh, commerce is concerned uh, and transportation uh, uh, is one reason that we fared better than most of the southeastern states. But later on, you saw governors like Governor Alexander of, South, of uh, Tennessee uh, some of the other governors that really took a lead in this greatly benefit their states as a result of this common effort that we were so active in in Georgia. A recent poll of 50 Georgia historians rated you the most fiscally conservative of Georgia's last eight governors. Would you think that's an accurate assessment? Uh, I don't know what a fiscal conservative is in a lot of things. I think I spent some money for programs. I spent all the money that we took in. But I think that I did do something that was different, and that is uh, within government itself. I, I restructured uh, within government, I think, uh, uh, to a degree that I would have been called very conservative as far as the bureaucracy is concerned. I don't know how to answer your question, though, about uh, being the most uh, conservative of all the governors. I think Governor Harris today is probably as conservative as I was. Well, he was not included in that <laughs> poll. <laughs> that, that same poll, incidentally, also rated you highest of the eight governors in overall communication and interpersonal skills. 
that is, in dealing with the legislature, the bureaucrats, the press, and the special interests? Uh, well, I had, uh, there's no question that, uh, that, uh, that uh, as far as intergovernmental relations, that I was more involved with, with state and local and with state and national relations than any governor. And a lot of that, though, was a result of the times. This was in a budget crunching process in the federal government when they were cutting out federal programs. Uh, I became involved in working with the, uh, with the um, federal government of necessity. Here lately we've heard some talk about the two Georgias, the wealthy growing area and then the poor declining area. Uh, do you see that as a, as a problem? Yes, I, I do. And, and it's a very difficult thing to address because you have certain industries that are going to locate within 50 miles of the metropolitan area of Atlanta. Uh, I think it, uh, that uh, there is a need for us to recognize that when we built the ports in Savannah, that when we built the infrastructure that I've described in Atlanta, that we had the support of the legislature overall. And as we look today to the needs of the state, we need to look to that infrastructure that's needed in the rural areas of our state for them to make economic progress. Uh, I do think it's a problem, and I think it's something that deserves state attention and the same teamwork that we had when we built the infrastructure in the urban area. You know, there are many areas that are having economic problems in, in Georgia. But look at the little county I live in. I live in Polk County, which is roughly 75 miles from here. And yet it's, it's overall a poor county. Uh, the educational level is, is low. It has very little industry. Uh, the population is older than the average. It has limited water. It has no interstate highways. Uh, what can be done to really uh, improve the economic uh, level of that community? Well, uh, it's a problem, but I, I see towns that like Fitzgerald, Georgia, or Hawkinsville, Georgia, you say, well, what can a town like that do? I think it's where you have local leaderships working with state leaderships that you can do something. I saw international industries located in Hawkinsville, Georgia. I see an economic boom in Fitzgerald, Georgia, and manufacturing facilities. And I can look at similar sized towns that, uh, that are not doing well at all. I think that uh, it, it requires teamwork um, locally along with the state. Another thing, that uh, some of the towns that were active uh, in building the infrastructure uh, like in sewage disposal and all that uh, were a part of the federal grantsmanship when they would go in and, and be active and where some towns really were not that progressive. And you were mentioning a moment ago about the intergovernmental relations that we had as a state as a whole. Uh, I created uh, for the first time a model, as far as President Reagan stated when we had the federalism debate, that Georgia was a perfect model in the state relationships with local government. We created the Department of Community Affairs where the board of directors, so to speak, are made up of local government people. And uh, we would take the federal grants and the governor didn't hand, them, hand it down to the local governments as patronage. It was done in a professional staff under the guidance of a, a board composed of local officials and controlled by local officials. And. Uh, when it came to the intergovernmental relations that you were referring to a while ago, uh, I think that, uh, that uh, well, I know that I was particularly grateful for the role that I was able to play in the area of Georgia's intergovernmental relations, which I think benefited all areas of our state. And my involvement had four distinct, distinct uh, dimensions. And one was in protecting and, advances, and, and advancing Georgia's single interest in the uh, federal legislative and administrative decisions and uh, another was to uh, to get grants for all areas of our state regardless of the size of these areas by participating in the federal process. Uh, we had formulas that were being written early on in my administration that favored the urban areas of the north and that discriminated against the the poor areas and, and some of the poorest areas in our states uh, and our state was the worst hit. And uh, we passed, I know, back in 1900 and uh, 
early 1975 or 76, we passed the Talmadge Nunn Amendment, which uh, saved Georgia $27 million because of the discrimination that would have uh, taken place against the uh, various areas in our state had it not passed. In uh, working to protect Georgia's interest in uh, in administrative decisions from federal agencies, and particularly in the uh, human resources, Medicaid, and the uh, human resource areas, I met with five different secretaries of state uh, to secure regulatory modifications that would allow more flexibility to administer programs throughout Georgia uh, in in, uh, in uh, the Medicaid program. And the transportation, which we talked about as being an important part of the infrastructure, I headed the uh, transportation committee for the National Governors Conference before I was chairman. And we had a historic meeting, and no one ever recalls, but on the, we, we needed to resolve some some real differences between state and federal government in these programs. And I had the Secretary of Transportation Brock Adams down to Sapelo Island, which is a state-owned, and we got uh, we got national and state leaders together in, on an island where they couldn't get off and leave without resolving these differences. And that's where <laughs> the national transportation policy was designed right there on Sapelo Island. And then I had the, the opportunity to, after that to serve as chairman of the National Governors Association from 1980 to 1981. And this gave me an opportunity to, to increase Georgia's national exposure as a prime support of reforms and national policies which were really diametrically opposed to the best interest of the states. Uh, we met with President Reagan early on as we tried to go through the federalism process and sort out the responsibilities of the state and federal government. Uh, I think though that uh, the one thing that I enjoyed in international matters was serving on President Carter's and then President uh, President Reagan's uh, uh, Export Council. This resulted from my being asked by President Carter to serve as chairman of the uh, first uh, uh, International Trade and Foreign Relations Committee of the governors. I saw during these eight years the governors take on a new role and dimension at a federal level working together through an association. At the uh, Southern Governors Conference, at one point you charged that the South was being raped by Northern congressmen. What did you mean by that remark? And what prompted it? Well, they had the voting power uh, to pass formulas which favored areas uh, of the North where you had population centers. And, uh, it, and it discriminated against the South. That was like the Talmadge Nunn Amendment that I just alluded to. I had a debate with uh, Senator Moynihan uh, that, uh, that pointed out many of the uh, formulas that they had which were very unfavorable to the South. Uh, they did not really consider our poverty level, our needs were not adequately expressed in the formulas, and we were very successful in organizing uh, through the Southern governors and correcting some of these formulas. What do you think of President Reagan's political philosophy? Well, the one thing that came close to being in Reagan's administration that did not occur, and I don't blame him with all of it, is, is the federalism question, because he had a very deep commitment to trying to sort out between the state and federal government things that the state could do best, things that the local governments could do best, and things that the national government could do best. And we had uh, five governors, uh, I was the chairman, and you had two Democrats and two Republicans that sat across the table from the president, the vice president, uh, the secretaries of the various uh, departments of the federal government, uh, uh, the Office of Planning and Budget, David Stockman, and we tried to sort out this process and came extremely close, but it failed. We, we, did, we did pass some, but the overall uh, proposal failed. Mm -hmm. But he generally was was rather sympathetic with some of the things that, that you were trying to accomplish. I, I thought so, yes. I, I think he understood them. And I, I, I really think that if we could uh, have a federalism sorting out to where uh, the federal government was not in all the state programs, that we could do better in state government to manage our own programs. Okay. You did a lot toward uh, 
streamlining uh, the Georgia government. I guess some of it was out of necessity because of the uh, financial crunch that you faced. But uh, what, what sort of things did you really attempt to change in, in economizing government? Well, uh, I think some of this might be reflected in, in just the everyday administration of state government. When I came in, I, I uh, upgraded the Department of Administrative Services, I brought in a professional, and uh, the Medicaid program, I, I, I had to completely revamp it. A lot of these were just putting in simple business practices in the operation of state government when hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars was being spent. Uh, so I think it was just really uh, addressing some of the faults that we had in the bureaucracy which had just grown over the years and we were just able to be more efficient in the process. I guess it's a natural tendencies for bureaucracies to, to just get bigger and bigger and then periodically they have to be cut down to size or they just become unwieldy and inefficient. That's, that's true and I, I get credit for cutting back on uh, the, the number of employees in state government but I have to give uh, President Carter credit when, uh, for his reorganization program. He put into place a structure of state government by, by doing away with so many different agencies and centralizing in various uh, uh, departments functions it was able I was able to go in and, 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 and uh, streamline the, the operation because of what he had done so uh, he got criticized because he he stepped on so many toes and, and restructuring the government then I was able to come and, and really put uh, uh, business principles into the various agencies there I think what helped me more than anything though was the type of appointments that I made okay let's uh would you mention the uh, the Medicaid situation uh, before we get into the appointments, I think that was an area that, that gave you a lot of headaches, particularly in the early part of your administration. Well, the Medicaid was simply a nightmare, and, and President Carter's always thanked me for not ever saying anything critical about what he had done. I said, I wouldn't have done any good to blame you, but I, I was going <laughs> to inherit it anyway. But that was one thing, it was uh, kind of a mess. And I remember when President Ford and President Carter were in the famous debates that uh, President uh, Ford uh, said that Busby said that uh, Medicaid uh, said that state government was in shambles when he took over. The words that I said to the president, which I didn't think I'd ever hear again, was that I thought the Medicaid program was in shambles, and I, I can't blame Carter with all of that. It was something that just grew and grew until like a cancer. But uh, when I took over, the Medicaid program wasn't a nightmare. We had claims that were being uh, service for over four months after they were filed uh, and, and still not being paid. We had providers, uh, hospitals and doctors that uh, were being overpaid. We had some that were being underpaid. We had some that were paid for the same services more than one time. It was just a, an administrative nightmare, but uh, we did address this and that was one change that I had to make in this structure is to segregate Medicaid from everything else bring in professionals, address that one problem, and cure it, and we were able to do that. Okay. I guess uh, just as Medicaid cost had grown over the years, so had the prison populations and the expenses involved. The prisons were the largest problem that I had uh, financially. As, as I started off with a bad recession or depression. I ended up with a recession, and I think that we spent more money on, on prisons and just about any other capital expenditures that we've made. I don't have the statistics in front of me, but the prison population uh, more than doubled. Uh, it was much more than doubled during the term that I was, uh, t uh, the two terms I was in office. But uh, it was a never ending process of providing enough prison space. And I also was hampered by court decisions. Uh, they had a case that said that uh, at Reesville I had to provide a single private cell for each prisoner. Uh, after providing this, the courts later turned it down, but I'd already spent the money, or the state had already spent the money for all the improvements. It's something that was necessary. I had to spend a lot of money in the prisons, but as I look today, it's continued just like it did during my administration. It's a never-ending process. But for a state as poor as Georgia, I hated to devote that many resources to the prisons, but uh, I had no choice in it. Well, I've read the, your total budget increased 119%, but the budget 
for offender rehabilitation increased 293 percent. And that's really not fair to the uh, educational programs we have, the transportation programs that are needed, and other things, but you have to do something with these prisoners. It was just an unhappy inheritance that I had. Uh, and the numbers have continued to increase uh, since you left office, haven't right. they? Right, and, and it's doing this in other states. It's a problem that uh, that uh, has to be addressed because it's just taken so some, some many resources. And I think that uh, you have to look at uh, alternative programs, which we did, but uh, I don't have a solution to the prison problem. Well, that was my, my next question was, in addition to simply building more cells, were there changes in the structure of the prisons, any any different programs, or release programs, or rehabilitation programs? We, we did, and uh, I, I think one thing that uh, we saw was the recidivism rate was so high in Georgia, one of the highest in the nation. So what we would have the the typical prisoner was a 26 year old black male from Fulton County. He would be sent down to Reedsville, generally involving some type of larceny. He served his time, he was given a $50 suit, about $50 in money, and a bus ticket back to Atlanta. Well, when he got back to Atlanta, he'd get off at the Greyhound station, and if he got a job that day, he wouldn't get a paycheck before his money had run out. And <clears throat> So that person was going to be returning. It was just a continuous cycle of recidivism. We did address that. We, had, uh, we put in vocational programs in the prisons. And I think one of the greatest deterrents that you have to this recidivism is the way you can train a person for a job skill, put him in a halfway house, get him a job before you release him from prison, and try and recycle him into the, into the uh, system. And we had some success, but we have a long ways to go still. Okay. Despite the uh, uh, recession and the prison crisis, uh, Generally, it seems state affairs were conducted very smoothly during your eight years. In fact, there was such a little bit of controversy and conflict that some complained the, the period was boring. You know, we're used to conflicts and excitement, and it was quite different. Um, it would seem to me that part of this would be not only your relationship with the legislature, but your, some of your key appointments, some of these people that really ran the divisions of government and must have done a pretty good job. How did you? pick some of these people? Well, I, I had been in the legislature. I, I had seen many things uh, going on over the years that were just kind of accepted as a part of the political process. And I thought if this state was ever going to move forward, we ought to address it. Transportation was one. And so that was, I suppose, the greatest trauma we've ever had is, is when I pushed Moreland into the position he's in as a professional for the first time in the highway department. But we had a, a lot of other needs. We had. Um, like in the Revenue Department. Over a period of years, the Revenue Department had, had uh, accumulated a lot of people through political patronage. We, we, I, didn't, I didn't think had real professionals in the Revenue Department really looking at revenue laws and revenue collections and, and things that needed to be done there. And that's when I uh, got, Gail, uh, I got uh, Nick Chilibus who, uh, to come in just with the understanding he would stay for a few years to straighten it out. Uh, he did do that. I uh, brought into the Department of Administrative Services Gail Manley, an executive that had no political background, just like Chilovitz and Molin, and took over uh, the administration of state government through the Department of Administrative Affairs, which services all the departments in the government, and we were able to put the business practices in. It was people like Manley that helped me attack the Medicaid problem. But uh, one of the more significant things in law enforcement was in the GBI. The GBI, over a period of years, was dominated by the sheriffs and local law enforcement. And I can remember as a young legislator, the primary duty of a GBI agent was to go get cigarettes and coffee for the sheriffs in the local communities where they served. And their jobs came from the legislatures, that, uh, legislators that uh, you know recommended their appointments. So I, I uh, after being elected, contacted the FBI in Washington. I, uh, Worked with the FBI here. I wanted them to give me some candidates to appoint to head the GBI. I was determined I was going to make a professional organization out of it. When I ran, I had many of the sheriffs say, "You know, we support you if you do one thing. That's just leave us alone after you get elected. We don't want a state police force." Well, I didn't want a state police force, but I said there there is a need at a state level to have a Georgia Bureau of Investigation. There is a need to improve the state crime lab. 
which is now the best in the nation. So I said I would like to have a Georgian, if the FBI could find one, that's 50 years of age uh, or less. But he doesn't have to be a Georgian. They came back and they said, we have the number three men in the FBI, Beverly Ponder. I said, I'm not looking for a long-term appointment. I want someone that will come in and be a perfect, and uh, well, I can't describe uh, exactly the words I use, but a perfect, mean man that will come in and shake up and move out after he's restructured it. And it will stand up uh, for what needs to be done at the state level. So they recommended Beverly Ponder, who was ready to retire. He didn't need the job, didn't want the job. We pressured him and taken the job, and he's one that made a professional organization out of the FBI. Uh, I also inherited some good people that I changed the roles of. Uh, I think Leonard Ledbetter, who was working in the Department of Natural Resources, heading up the Environmental Protection Agency, is a good example of this because he worked with me throughout my entire administration and, and I had worked with him as a legislator in passing all of the uh, air and water quality control legislation measures that were passed and continued to work with him as governor. So I changed his role to where well, he reported directly to the gov uh, governor on these affairs and not just to the department. And we were able to come up with parameters that protected our environment but at the same time permitted us to take over the administration of environmental protection laws for the federal government as well as the state government. And we could just have one permit when the industry wanted to locate, they didn't have to go to five different state agencies and then the federal government, they could just get his signature and, uh, and uh, do business. And he had complete com uh, credibility with the environmentalists in our state and so this was a big help in itself. What about some others like uh, Jim McIntyre, wasn't he director of Planning and Budget? Uh, Jim McIntyre was the uh, Director of uh, Office of Planning and Budget in the Carter administration. He's a person that was a professional. He had good people under him, and when Carter took him to Washington, I was able to take Clark Stevens as number one man, and he became a leader among Office and Planning and Budget uh, directors for the entire nation. Mm -hmm. Tim Riles? Well, uh, this is another thing that I did in state government. I created uh, two things for the consumer. One was the consumer of office affairs. Uh, Dr. Riles uh, had great credibility among consumer groups and advocates, and I made him the head of that department. This is the first time we ever had any agency in state government to represent the consumer. I did the same thing, though, over in the Public Utilities Commission, where we had no one to speak for the public when it came to utility rates. and. Uh, uh, con, con, uh, creating an a, a advocate within the, the uh, Public Service Commission for the consumer. Mm -hmm. Let's see, wasn't Joe Tanner with the Department of Natural Resources? And Joe Tanner was with uh, Carter as head of the Department of Natural Resources, uh, led better work done to him with the Environmental Protection Agency, and I kept the both. Kept both of them. Uh, let's see. Then uh, the Secretary of State died while you were governor. Uh, been fortunate, had been Secretary of State as long as I can remember in state government. And um, so I was able to appoint uh, Secretary of State. The Secretary of State really did not figure into anything that I was doing as far as education or economic development, but the important thing was uh, they have the various uh, regulatory boards for professional groups. And I think that we made a, a great step forward and updating, modernizing, and requiring training for the various people in those groups. Had David uh, Poitras uh, held other state positions before you appointed him? No. Okay. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah Dave, I'm sorry, I didn't understand. David Poitras did hold other state positions before I appointed him there, yes. Mm -hmm. okay. I guess uh, your experience in the legislature or uh, was one reason you were able to come up with some of these people. You, you, you knew the agencies and, and knew the personnel. But I've just been quite impressed by the, the quality of appointments uh, here. Did you have a, a, a group of advisors or, or others to help you uh, select some of these people, or particularly when you get to judges or regents? Yes, I, on, on every score. I, I had advisors, different advisors for the various groups. Uh, I had uh, for, for I know for um, 
Department of Transportation would have been entirely different than when I appointed a state board, uh, uh, a state uh, school superintendent. But I had, in every single instance, I had some advisors that to, 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 to advise me, and I might say that uh, many of the people I appointed I did not know before they were appointed. Uh, like Beverly Pond, I mentioned, I never saw him until he came in my office, uh, uh, and I asked him to, to head the GBI. Tom Morland, uh, I might have seen but didn't remember. So they were not necessarily uh, people that had supported you or or knew you personally? Well, like now in, in the case of Gail Manley, uh, uh, he was from my hometown. I knew him as a very successful businessman. And Nick Chilovis, I'd, I'd known uh, for many years, uh, and he was a strong supporter too. But uh, he was one that, uh, he's the only person that's ever served as revenue commissioner and had to be begged to take the job. But, uh, and it was with the idea he wouldn't stay but a few years. And your own office staff uh, included Norman Underwood and Tom Perdue, did it not? Yes, both of whom worked in my campaign. That was a political point. Mm -hmm. We've looked at uh, a lot of the positive things in your administration. I guess to be fair, we need to look at the negatives also. And there are two things that, that you've been criticized for, and I'd like to get your reactions to them. Uh, first is the Jesse Bowles uh, affair. Uh, what was it he resigned and, and you named a successor and this created some consternation? Exactly what happened there? Uh, the, I don't know of anything that uh, ever happened in my administration. I, I was more upset and I thought uh, accused of unjustly. Jesse Bowles was a great justice of the Supreme Court with grave personal problems that no one knew about, including myself. He came to me to resign numerous times, several times I should say, and I really didn't appreciate the problems that he had uh, within his family. He came and to have breakfast with me at the governor's mansion. I begged him to stay on. He did stay on. And he stayed until a point in time that uh, I've forgotten the exact days now, but between a certain time frame if uh, he were to resign during that time, uh, then it would be up to a different selective process and the governor making an appointment. But if he'd stayed another few weeks, then it would be up to the governor. Well, that didn't even enter into to Jesse Bowles' resignation. I just asked him to stay on until, you know, we had a decent person to appoint. So I just hated for his sake that he went through what he did, but mainly Hardy Gregory, whom I'm appoint I appointed, a great justice, he was a victim of all of this and had to run again. Well, I had to run for the first time after I appointed him. He was elected overwhelmingly, but uh, the, there was no political connection whatsoever, and it was something that I thought was unjust in, in an accusation. However, the federal court ruled that he had to run, that, 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 that uh, he had effectively resigned in this period of time, and it really was, it was he had been to me numerous times. Had he gone, if I had accepted his resignation when he first came to me, then it would have been, nothing would have come. I would have made the appointment. It would have all been away. I just begged him to stay on until he, he quit at the wrong time, I suppose. Well, eventually a couple of citizens sued, claiming that they had been denied the right to vote, and the Supreme Court agreed, so it necessitated another election. That's which correct. Which cost the state a lot of money. But Gregory won, so in the net. The final result was, is it really no difference? Well, yes, uh, it was no difference, but I hate it for their sake uh, that, that they were drug into the thing. Uh -huh. I was going to ask you about other judges. That, of course, to me is one of the most important appointments that a, mm -hmm. that a governor or president makes. Uh, who are some of the judges that you appointed? Gee, I, I don't have the article before me, but I appointed over half of the Superior Court judges that you now have in the state of Georgia. Is that right? I appointed all but about three of the appellate judges on the Supreme Court and the Court of Appeals. So I had an opportunity of appointing many, many judges. And that's really, as far as appointments, I think I'm proud of that than just about any other segment because I had a judicial nominating commission and everyone seeking a judgeship appointment went before this judicial nominating committee and I had to pick from the, under my own policy, I had to pick from the uh, people that they felt were the most qualified. And I know one of the first appointments I made was to appoint a person 
uh, was a support of Lestomatics that was found by the Judicial Nominating Commission to be very superior to one of my own chairman of one of my county committees. And so that was the first appointment that I made was less than my Is that right? judge, but uh, I, I appointed uh, more judges than any governor in history. I guess Thomas Marshall, the uh, current chief justice, was one of your appointments, wasn't he? I, he? I appointed him to the Supreme Court. He was serving on the Court of Appeals, and I appointed him to the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. Okay. What about members of the Board of Regents? You, I guess you've pointed quite a few of those, too, yes, since you uh, had eight years in office. Well, they, of course, have a, a seven-year term, so some are still serving. You, uh, oh, the other negative thing I wanted to get into, of course, would be your pension. Mm -hmm. You have uh, stated publicly, uh, quoting from the Atlanta Journal, uh, it's clear to me that what's legal is not necessarily what's right in this situation. I now realize I made a mistake in asking for those benefits in the first place. Would you explain your, your thinking at the time and uh, how you view it now? Well, when I went out, I really thought that, uh, you know, I'm, I'll be 60 years old this August. I thought that I would like to be able to retire. I'd spent everything I had while I was governor and uh, that legally I was entitled to the retirement. I, got, I went into a prosperous law firm. Uh, was making a decent living. You had uh, uh, ex-governor Maddox who was in bad health, broke, and with cancer. He needed, he was not eligible for a time, and they said give it to a person that needs it. And uh, this um, just came in the public eye that, you know, here's a person that doesn't need the retirement now. It's not right for him to have the retirement now. You get service for legislative credits that, uh, that other people have retired with, but uh, is, in viewing it with me, uh, that I didn't need the retirement. I think that was the main thing that, that, uh, that uh, generated the opposition. But what hurt was that, uh, that uh, I went through eight years as being governor. I really had no criticism about anything I'd ever tried to do for me for personal gain, and finally it just became an embarrassment. And I just said, even if I'm legally entitled to it, it's not worth it to me to, to take it. So uh, I just abandoned the effort, and if I could go back again, I just wish it never had happened. I'm sure. As a philosophical matter, do you think it's it's proper for legislators to count legislative service, which is technically part time, toward a full time retirement? No, I, I don't think so. In, in retrospect, I don't. At the time this was passed, I did because I, th I think in order to attract somebody to serve, that that is, uh, is, is of some benefit to attract someone to run. But uh, looking back on it now, I think it ought to be paraded the way it's not. But there will probably be others coming up in the future who will be retiring and using some of this service. Yes, so. but, that, but see, that's corrected, though, in the legislative retirement. That's reflected in what they're doing today, so that's been corrected. Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, when you ran for governor, you got considerable support from blacks in the state. Uh, would you describe uh, your racial policies or your relationships with some of the blacks or leaders in the state? Well, of course, I had, uh, I had good support uh, from the black community. I think one of the reasons was that the, for the economic improvements that I had promised to make and also for educational improvements because I felt that the black leadership felt that particularly for the blacks, this was even a greater need than it was for the whites. I had uh, Julian Bond, I had Ben Brown, I had a lot of the uh, political activists from the black community that were helpful. I think one of the deciding, uh, one of the deciding uh, votes that I got was, was not just in the primary, it was down in Savannah when uh, the, they voted as a group down there as to whom to support. And uh, Bert Lance and I really had a go at who was going to get those votes, and I finally got it by, by the narrow margin. But it was a significant uh, process. But uh, without black support, I don't think I would have been elected because if Bert Lance had gotten all of that, uh, along with his other support, he'd have probably been in the runoff against Lester Maddox. You appointed some blacks to the Board of Regents, I believe. Yeah. Uh, who are, did you appoint any other blacks to top positions in government? Yeah, I had. Uh, uh, Medicaid, I uh, 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 black. I had uh, uh, 
I don't have the statistics before me, I'm going to have to fill you in, but I have a list of all the black appointments that I've made and the percentage from blacks to white, male to female, uh, male to female but uh, it was a very balanced uh, number. I just don't have it before me. Uh -huh. okay. I'd like to see that sometime. Uh, what are your own views on affirmative action? Uh, we, uh, I don't like a quota process of where you, just because you're black, you're going to get something. If you're white, you're going to get something. Yet you have to do something affirmatively, or you're not going to be able to have blacks to, to, to benefit by state programs along with whites. What I tried to do was, is to, like in the highway department, identify why a black firm is unable to compete with a white firm and address the problem. We had, uh, like on the highways, uh, you have uh, uh, landscape or grassing, and they would do large segments, and you'd have to have a large bond capacity, and a, and a small black firm wouldn't be able to, to, to have raise a bond to bid, even, and even though the quality of the work was good. We addressed that by breaking down the segments. We had uh, blacks that didn't know how to compete with whites in bidding for, for supplies and things, uh, services. We created within at the University of Georgia. We created a special program to assist these people to to to, to be able to compete. That's affirmative action. Uh, I don't think that it's done enough to correct all the needs. I think you need a lot more programs. You need to identify why more black firms that compete are not successful, and then correct those problems where it's possible. Supreme Court ruled just this past week on a rather controversial case regarding the hiring or promoting of, of a woman because she was a woman rather than on her qualifications. Do you have any thoughts on that particular case? I, I don't agree with that at all. No. I think that uh, to, if, you have, uh, if you have discrimination in any manner against a black, against a woman, against anyone, that you ought to correct that discrimination now. But I don't think that you can go back and, and say that uh, 20 years ago you were unfair to a person or to a group of people and that you're going to discriminate against an existing group today in order to make up for what was done by the people in the past. I don't, I don't, I don't believe in that. It appears that you enjoyed being governor. Uh, I guess you'd have to to serve eight years. Was there anything about the job you didn't like? Uh, yes, yeah, so one thing is that uh, I was totally devoted to the job, and it, and I did not like not having a family life. I had something every night, every morning. I would go a week, not have one meal with my wife, just just family. Uh, the mansion was uh, was the greatest asset that I had. We did more. We had house guests every week. We had uh, we had uh, many uh, events there. We didn't we didn't have any family life. That's the one thing that I regret. Well, your wife must, I missed it. Must be very understanding. To but uh, <laughs> she was. But I think really the mansion of my wife. Uh, I give her a lot of credit because we. I had industrialists from this country that uh, would uh, stay there. I had people from all over the world that stayed at the mansion. I had many uh, banquets. I had many breakfasts. I had many luncheons and many dinners and many receptions. And I think it benefited the state, but it detracted from your family life. Looking back now, what do you consider your most important accomplishment as governor, and your most and your biggest disappointment? Well, looking at accomplishments, I, I, I think the timing was right for me as far as the state and as far as the nation was concerned. I think I served as governor during a transitional period. I think that there were three trends in which I served in some degree as a transitional figure or you might say a leader. And one was Georgia's emergence from the segregation and the civil rights era. The second would be the South's emergence in the national and in the international economy. And the third was uh, the emergence of governors as uh, independent bipartisan force in national politics uh, and what I did to, with the national governors. Uh, my disappointment would be in two areas. I'm, I'm satisfied with what we did in economic development, but I'm disappointed that I had two uh, recessions that really hampered what I'd like to have done in education. Uh, that was a disappointment to me. The other thing is uh, the prisons. 
I don't have a solution today. I didn't have one when I was governor. Uh, I was dictated in many of the things that I did do by the courts, and we spent an inordinate amount of money, and I think that if we could uh, spend the same amount of money uh, uh, the way we wanted to spend it, I think we could have done a better job than just reacting to mandates of uh, federal courts. Are you optimistic or pessimistic about the future? What's in store for Georgia? I'm very optimistic. Uh, I, th I think that, uh, that uh, Georgia as a whole is going to continue to be a leader as far as economic development. Uh, we're the hub of all commerce here in Atlanta now, but again, that presents the problem of the whole state. The big problem we're going to have for economic development is not going to be in the urban areas, it's going to be in the rural areas of Georgia as you change from agriculture, as you change from textiles uh, as being the main uh, manufacturing uh, base. Uh, we're going to have to have the same team effort that we had to build the infrastructure we have today from all of the state to concentrate uh, in, in building this infrastructure in the rural areas of the, of the state. You know, I could list a great many problems we face in our society and everybody's aware of, you know, crime, drugs, AIDS, suicide, environmental concerns, the uh, loss of jobs to the Japanese and other firms or other countries, or breakup of the families, corruption and all this sort of thing. Uh, yet you have an optimistic view. Do you, uh, how do you deal with some of these issues in your optimism? Well, I, I don't know that I do deal with many of the things that you have <coughs> just listed, all of which I agree are great problems. But I think what I try to do is, and be optimistic about it is to look what I can do that will help Georgia, that will help this country, and uh, utilize my time on that. And if I could address some of the areas that you've just mentioned as being problems and be as effective there as I am in maybe economic development, uh, I'd do so. But I think there are other people that uh, could do that and let me do what I can do best. Let me ask you about the, uh, the Democratic Party. Uh, You've been a lifetime Democrat, and I'm sure you're still active in the party to some extent. Uh, to what extent uh, do you participate in party matters now? Well, of course, uh, Governor is the titular head of the party, uh, continues to be today. Uh, the only way that I'm going to be active in the party, if you have candidates that I can identify with that stand for principles that I stand for, and I think one of the disappointments that I had was my closest political friend, Sam Nunn, uh, kind of hung it up uh, running for president. Uh, I was disappointed. I can identify with him. And maybe a person like that that I do identify with will emerge. And if I do, I'll, I'll be active. But if you have someone that, uh, that I don't, uh, like Gary Hart, or would to be successful, then I don't plan to support the Democratic mm -hmm. candidate. Uh, it would appear to me that, that your own political views are probably closer to Reagan's than to Mondale's. Is that a fair assessment? I would, I would think so, yes. Uh, Not on Iran, though. <laughs> uh, well, speak of domestic issues. What about your, your currently practicing law with uh, King and Spaulding? Uh, what is your specialty? and? Uh, would you tell us a little bit about your, your daily routine as a lawyer? Well, uh, I'm very fortunate being with a larger firm like this that they, they allow me to do those things that I, I want to do and it doesn't have to be just f for the firm in the way of a client. I'm able to participate uh, like MacFed. I ran for three years after I went out of office. Uh, it takes an inordinate amount of time, but it's something I think is needed uh, for the economic development of the state. Uh, I uh, spend a great deal of time now traveling abroad and about half of it's for the firm and about half of it would be for, for, for really for the state and for various communities in the state. Uh, um, I'm very active in the uh, Atlanta chamber. I head the international division and I make at least two trips abroad now with business leaders from Georgia, uh, both to the Orient and to Europe. I'll be going to, this year I'll be going to Zurich uh, next month and I'll and to uh, the northern part of Italy. I've just met with leaders from those areas and I'll be going to Japan and Korea and Taiwan and Hong Kong and back to uh, Japan in, in, uh, in the fall. All of that is, is for economic development. 
So I spend uh, uh, about, uh, I would say about half my time in, in non-firm matters. And I think as, uh, most of the larger firms then feel like there's some obligation on, uh, for a large firm to participate in those things, and some partners are better able to do it than others, and others are better at staying and keeping the nose in the books and tending the client's business. <laughs> in your, your foreign travels, uh, I'm intrigued by that. I know you spend so much time over there, uh, and you say part of it is, is for, for business development. Do you meet with other businessmen there, or do you, do you try to get together with political leaders, or just, just what do you do? All of us business people. I, I do meet, uh, uh, I would say, 5% of the time with political leaders, but, uh, but mainly it's CEOs and presidents of companies that I think might be interested in trade or reverse investment in Georgia. I spend a lot of time, too, with, uh, with uh, things like airlines, uh, promoting international routes. Uh, I'm, I'm very much involved in, in trade matters. All right, on a more personal note, uh, are you involved in any particular uh, civic interest, local civic interest, or charities, or church activities, or anything of that nature? Well, uh, of course, uh, as far as Club, no, I don't, I don't have any weekly club that I go to to listen to speeches. I'm very active in just about everything going on in economic development, everything international I'm involved in as far as the church is concerned. I moved 27 miles uh, from my office here in Atlanta up in Gwinnett County on the Chattahoochee, and my wife and I, uh, when we were in Albany before I was governor, we moved out in a suburban area. And we formed a church along with others, uh, Sherwood Baptist Church, and since we moved out to, to Duluth, we formed the Parkway Baptist Church. We started off meeting in my living room, and now we've progressed to where well, we have a little office building we meet in, but we're building a church there now, so we're very involved in church matters there. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess you finally have a little bit of time for family life, but you've traveling as much as you do, I guess your wife doesn't see you too much. Oh, no. I, I'm, I'm, at, I'm at home, I would say, three or four nights a week when I'm in, in town. I do travel a lot. This weekend I'll be picking up two grandchildren. I have twin grandsons that I'm going to pick up and take fishing for three or four days. That was unheard of when I was governor, so mm -hmm. I do those things now. Uh -huh. I guess you enjoy your, your family, especially oh, yeah. the grandchildren. Right. Okay. 